So good evening, everyone. We are joined together by the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. My name is Father David Neuhaus. I am visiting the Institute this year. I am an Israeli Jesuit of South African birth and very happy to be with you, for those of you who know me, to be with you once again. This series is to prepare us for Advent. And before I even explain what we're going to do in these four meetings, let's begin with an Advent song, a time of prayer and meditation, as we prepare to study a little more about the texts that we have for the Christmas season. sing this hymn first. So let's begin again. We are going to be doing a four-part series. 
And the four parts will be tonight, we'll look at the figure of Joseph. Next week, we'll look at the figure of Mary. And then we are going to look at the relationship between a Jesus who is from Nazareth and yet born in Bethlehem. And then finally, we'll be looking at Jesus himself, the moment of Jesus' birth, and in a special way, his name. So let's dive into an introduction to this wonderful theme. So, Jesus' infancy. We have a very early mention, and when I say early, of course, I'm speaking as an exegete, a scholar of scripture. The first part of the New Testament was written by St. Paul, the seven letters that St. Paul wrote among the 14 attributed to him. And in the epistle to the Galatians, Paul writes, and we're talking about a text that dates to probably the middle of the 50s of the first century. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that they might receive adoption as children. Indeed, this would be the earliest text that we could call a Christmas text, and one of the few mentions outside of the Synoptic Gospels of the birth of Jesus, not giving us a lot of information, but very important information, that Jesus was indeed born like all of us, and obeyed the law like all the Jewish people of his time, a man and a Jew. Interesting to note that among the books of the gospel, Mark and John, the first book of the gospel to be written and the last, say nothing about Jesus' birth. They begin the Jesus narrative at the baptism. And so during these four weeks, we will be principally focusing on the gospel of St. Matthew and the gospel of St. Luke, who give us slightly different versions of the birth of Jesus. So let's, before we look at the differences, look at the similarities. Luke and Matthew, or rather in the order of their writing, Matthew and Luke agree that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We'll look at that closely in three weeks' time. That the birth took place in miraculous circumstances. It was not just a simple human birth, but God was very present in the birthing. That Jesus is son of David, descended from the great King David, and we'll look at that more closely a little later. They agree on the identity of the child, that the child is the long-awaited Messiah of Israel, that the child is, in a very particular way, the Son of God, that he is Savior and Redeemer. They also point out that already from the time of his birth, some will rejoice and some will reject him. And very importantly, and this will come out strongly in our four sessions, both of them rely very heavily on the Old Testament, the scriptures of Israel, those scriptures that provide a language, a vocabulary, a syntax to tell the Jesus story. Now, many have asked, what part of these narratives is historical? And we could spend weeks and weeks discussing that very prickly issue. Certainly, Jesus was born, and all of the rest is probable, likely, or improbable. People have been arguing for centuries about that. But what is important to realize at the outset is that neither Matthew nor Luke are historians in the modern sense. They are telling us more about what Jesus means in our lives, who he is in terms of his significance for humanity, rather than really telling us a detailed history, a biography of the man Jesus. And now let's jump into our first part. Our first part, as I said, focuses on 
Joseph, the son of Jacob, Joseph, Saint Joseph. I just want to say, I forgot to say this in the beginning, that as you are listening, if you have any comments or any questions, please write them into the chat, for there will be time after the 45 minutes that I speak, 15 minutes for discussion. We'll try and do that each time. And so, as we go into the figure of Joseph, the first thing we realize is that Joseph is principally and almost uniquely a character in the narrative of Matthew. We find him described in some detail in chapters one and two of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, when we look at the structure of those two chapters, we notice first and foremost that the book begins with a genealogy. That would be a very, very biblical way to begin a story, telling the origins of the main character. I will not be discussing that genealogy with you tonight for lack of time, but for those of you who are interested, there is a video out there on YouTube in which I give a lot more attention to those 17 verses at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. Remember, they are the 17 verses at the beginning of the New Testament, right at the place where the old and the new are joined together. And you can see there the title, Learning to Read Backwards from the Beginning, with the address or the, the site on which you can find that YouTube. The second part of these two chapters, the structure of these two chapters, revolves around five scriptural citations. Indeed, what is happening, and Joseph is really at the center of this, scripture is being fulfilled in the events that surround the birth of Jesus. And so we have, and we'll look at some of this in more detail later in our four courses, Isaiah 714, the Annunciation to Joseph, Behold, the Virgin is with child. Micah 5.2, a second narrative, the Magi, who are following the star and come to Jerusalem and learn from Scripture, from the book of Micah, that he must be born in Bethlehem. Hosea 11.1, 1, a third narrative that tells of the flight to Egypt, for it is from Egypt that God calls his son. And then Jeremiah 31, 15, Rachel weeping at the massacre of the innocents. And then a final, a fifth narrative, we'll discuss it a little in our third session, the strange fact of Nazareth presented at the end of chapter two as another evidence from scripture. And now we want to look more closely at Joseph again, Joseph, son of Jacob, as he's presented in the Gospel of Matthew. So first and foremost, I think that many of us have learned, we define Joseph as a righteous man, or in other language, a just man, Joseph the just one. Of course, that term refers to him being a man who accomplishes, lives fully the law, the Torah a good Jew. And this is a very, very important description of Joseph right at the outset. This Joseph is also son of Jacob, and this is the first time that he is named at the end of the genealogy, where it is written, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. And this Jesus at the first mention, is already called the Messiah, the one the people are waiting for, the anointed one, the promised one. Now, looking again at Joseph, and you will see here these two modern icons, we should immediately identify the fact that Joseph, son of Jacob, is not the first Joseph, son of Jacob, we have heard about unless we begin reading the Bible in the New Testament. We know a Joseph, son of Jacob, in the Old Testament. In fact, that Jacob appears early on in the genealogy, but having had 12 children, 
The child who is mentioned in the genealogy of Jacob is not Joseph, his 11th son, but rather Judah, through whom Joseph is descended, the Joseph of the New Testament. So let's look again at that. Joseph and Joseph, these two characters identified initially simply by the fact that they have the same name. I'm going to suggest that there is much more at stake than just having the same name. In fact, getting to know Joseph in the New Testament will depend very heavily on rereading those chapters in the book of Genesis, starting from Genesis 37, when Joseph's story is told. And so we have, yes, again, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. But that first Joseph, son of Jacob, is named for the first time in the book of Genesis in chapter 30, where it says, she named him Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. Well, let's pass that a little. First of all, the she there is Rachel. We remember Rachel is the beloved wife, not the only wife, but the really beloved wife of Jacob. And she would give birth to two sons, both of them dearly beloved to their father Jacob. The first one is called Joseph, which in Hebrew is Yosef. And it is derived from to add to. And when it is written here, may the Lord add to me another son, Rachel is already praying for the birth of that youngest son, Benjamin. Interesting to note that already here we realize that the name Joseph means a kind of non-completedness. Something needs to come to complete this righteous man in the New Testament called Joseph. And of course, we realize immediately that that addition will be the child that will be born to Mary. But now let's follow through some other parallels that are very revealing when we realize that Joseph in the New Testament is not the first Joseph that we should know well. Let us compare him to that Joseph in the Old Testament, a very important figure. Before we move on to cut the comparison, please notice the text that this Joseph, looking so much like an Egyptian, because that is where he will rise to a salvific power to save his brothers, the text written there is, you have done evil against me, but God meant it for good. Something Joseph says to his brothers in chapter 50 of the book of Genesis, a principle throughout the Bible, that indeed we do evil, but God is working hard to transform all that evil into good. Again, a theme that is very important in the New Testament. So let's look at a first issue that both of these Josephs have, both of these righteous men. And that is trouble with a woman. If I said that, people might be a little shocked at the beginning. But let's remember the text in Matthew chapter 1. Before they lived together, and we remember now that Joseph is engaged to a woman whose name is Mary. That Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Indeed, a very troubling situation for her husband would expect her to be a virgin. And if she is with child, that must imply that she is not. We are told already that the child is from the Holy Spirit. But this dilemma gives an opportunity to discover the righteousness of this Joseph, her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace plan to dismiss her quietly. Now that verse, in fact, uncovers that Joseph is more than righteous. A righteous man would have the right to denounce 
the woman he is engaged to, who is pregnant, and her fate would probably be a horrible fate. Indeed, who would believe that the Holy Spirit has impregnated her? Having been with a man, she has become pregnant and should be put to death. But unwilling to expose her to the public disgrace of a trial and worse, he dismisses her quietly, or thus is his intention. Trouble with a woman that will reveal the full contours of Joseph as a righteous man, but also a merciful man, being in the image and likeness of a God who is both just and merciful. But let us remember that this is parallel with the Joseph that we know from the book of Genesis, the Joseph who has been sold into slavery in Egypt, and his master's wife, Potiphar's wife. She takes a real liking to Joseph. He's very beautiful. And she says to him, lie with me. And Joseph is also a righteous man. Not only will he not commit that kind of impurity, but he will also not betray his master and will pray, will pay a heavy price for that. Please, can you switch off your microphones? He will pay a heavy price for that and spend time in prison. Notice again this interesting parallel, how the figure in the Old Testament gives greater depth to the one in the New. And we continue to a second parallel, very interesting. The Joseph that we know in the New Testament is a man of dreams. These dreams show his openness to listening carefully to words that lead him on an adventure, that were, those words are essential to his role of fathering Jesus. Let's go through these dreams Four times it is written in these two chapters that Joseph dreamed. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, in chapter 1, verse 20, addressing that embarrassing situation of the pregnancy of Mary and telling him not to fear, to take Mary into his home, for the child within her is from the Holy Spirit, and so he does. Then three times in chapter two, showing how essential Joseph is to the story. Without Joseph and his openness to the word in the dream, there would be no Jesus. Already Mary would have been stoned if he hadn't been righteous. But now an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, take the child and go to Egypt. For indeed, a wicked Pharaoh rules in Jerusalem who is going to come and kill the babies, trying to wipe out the promised savior, the one who competes as king. And so Joseph in a dream is told, save the child, father the child, nurture the child, protect the child. But if Joseph had suddenly then closed his ears to the word, he would not have been open to a dream in Egypt an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Egypt, to Joseph in Egypt, and said, get up and go back to the land, for the one who sought to do evil to the child is dead. And so Joseph once again plays an essential role in Joseph's openness to the word, in Joseph's openness to be father to a child that is Messiah, Savior, and Redeemer. And then when they enter the land, a last time at the end of chapter two, Joseph is again warned in a dream, open to that word that again sends him off on an adventure. Don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Bethlehem, where the son of that ruler who wanted to do evil is reigning now, but rather go to Nazareth. We will deal more with Nazareth in the third of our four lectures. And again, notice the parallel that Joseph, son of Jacob in the Old Testament, was a man of dreams, dreams that led him on a crazy adventure, a salvific adventure, 
For those dreams led him to lord it over his brothers, and they hated him for it. They sold him into slavery, but when he was in prison, he had dreams that saved the life of some and condemned others that would eventually lead him into the court of the Pharaoh, reading Pharaoh's dreams, it would lead him to a role of enormous power. And he would become a savior of those same brothers who had betrayed him. For when there was a famine in the world, Joseph's dreams had enabled Pharaoh to save up corn, corn that would save the Egyptians and also the brothers of Joseph who would come begging this ruler for corn. So, man of dreams, a wonderful parallel. Number three. Notice how both of our Joseph, sons of Jacob, go down to Egypt. As it is written there in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter two, then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. The prophet there, of course, is Hosea chapter 11. And what is being replayed here is the history of Israel going down to Egypt for salvation at the time of Joseph, son of Jacob in the Old Testament, and then being brought out of Egypt into the land. Indeed, in Genesis 37, they, the Ishmaelites, who had bought Joseph, his brothers had sold Joseph, and the Ishmaelites finally got their hands on him and took him to Egypt. Remember again the important role Egypt plays in the history of salvation. And a final, a fourth parallel, and a very fascinating one. Joseph, son of Jacob in the New Testament, this righteous man is a father, but perhaps not exactly a father, or perhaps fully a father, but in ways that are not of our understanding. Remember, Mary has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. It is not the seed of Joseph in her womb. But without Joseph, there would be no Jesus, for that holy seed would have been swallowed up in the events of a world hostile to the growth of that seed. Mary would have been stoned without a Joseph to come and take her into his house. Jesus would have been murdered with the innocents in Bethlehem had it not been for Joseph, who listened closely to the word and was willing to walk in the way of that word and take the child to Egypt. But if he had suddenly stopped listening, they would have stayed in Egypt a safe place, and never return to the land where the child must come back and grow and fulfill his mission to be the Messiah, to be the king of the people. And so we see again the essential role of Joseph. And it does not end when they do come back to the land, for when they come back to the land, Joseph learns they are not to go to the place where they left from, Bethlehem or even to Jerusalem, but rather to go to Nazareth. Now, what is very interesting is already at the beginning of the story, when the angel speaks the first time to Joseph in the dream, he says, she, Mary, will bear a son, and you, Joseph, are to name him Jesus. This, if we know well the Old Testament, is a very significant act to name, for it is the Father who names. Yes, indeed, God names Adam, Adam, in the genealogy that we have in chapter 5 of Genesis. 
And then Adam names Seth, his son. This is a paternal act par excellence. And by Joseph naming Jesus, Jesus, he is manifesting himself as a father. I might add that there are many fathers who are biological fathers, who have thrown out their sperm in ways in which we would not approve of. They do not take responsibility for children that are born out of that sperm. In fact, too many children in our world are without any father. And here is a very different model of father. This is Joseph, who we often call the adopted father. I don't like that term because by Joseph naming Jesus, he becomes Jesus's real father, asserting the paternal right to name him Jesus. He is Jesus's father. And we see that he becomes the custodian, the custodian of this child that needs from its very in, uh, 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 conception, protection from this wonderful Joseph, son of Jacob, a righteous man. What is interesting to note, however, is that this story of a father, but not a father, is also a parallel in this first Joseph that we meet in the book of Genesis. This is often not remembered or perhaps not even known. So I want to tell this story. And again, it is to underline something that is so important. The New Testament is written in shorthand. In order to really understand the New Testament, we must know well the language, the vocabulary, the ideas of the Old Testament, for it is rooted in that Old Testament, which gives it its fullest meaning. We often think that the new throws light on the old, but in an exactly the same way, the old throws light on the new. And so the first time we meet a father who is not a father is in the figure of Joseph. So let's read this text from Genesis 48. What is going on? Joseph, has become a very important man in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. He has extensive power, and his brothers have come to Egypt in search of food. They, when they come before him, do not recognize him. They had told their father that Joseph was dead, although in fact, in the end, they didn't put him to death, but rather sold him into slavery. Remember those words of Joseph on the icon? You have done me evil, but God has turned it into good. For now, Joseph has become a savior for his brothers. He can provide them with the food that they so lack, taking it back to Canaan. You'll remember it becomes a very complicated story where Joseph is insistent that they learn something through this experience. But as the brothers will then move down to the land of Egypt, bringing with them their father and Benjamin, Joseph's full brother, Jacob will die in the land of Egypt. Now, before he dies, this is chapter 48, he is very old and Joseph hears that Jacob has become weak and feeble and is about to die. So he comes to visit his father. You see this in this beautiful painting of Rembrandt. And he brings with him his two sons born to him in Egypt. The two sons are Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, as Jacob sits up in his bed to greet this beloved son, who he thought had been killed and has been restored to him, he says the following part of his words to Joseph just before he dies. He says, therefore, your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are now mine. 
Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are. As for the offspring born to you after them, they shall be yours. They shall be recorded under the names of their brothers with regard to their inheritance. Now notice something very interesting is happening here. And the rest of the Pentateuch and later narratives about the history of the people of Israel will bear witness to this. Jacob is in fact making Joseph a father who is not a father. Unlike the Joseph of the New Testament, he has naturally engendered two sons. But Jacob takes these two sons as his own, as Jacob's, making them equal to the other sons that he has, to Reuben and Simeon. Now, what is interesting is we know that this Jacob has 12 sons and the land will be divided among the 12 tribes that come from Jacob's loins. But when we find the land divided up and the names of the tribes that are given, we discover something very interesting. Joseph is absent. Instead of Joseph, we have Ephraim and Manasseh, those that have been taken as sons by Jacob. Yet that doesn't make 13 sons, for Levi, from whom the priests will descend, does not receive a portion of the land, and so it is still divided into 12. Again, what is so interesting here is the parallel between Joseph and Joseph, both of them Joseph, son of Jacob, both of them righteous men, both of them playing a very essential role in the history of salvation, both of them allowing for salvation to come to the people of God. And so as we come to the end of this first session, let us reflect for a few moments on the figure of Joseph, son of Jacob in the New Testament. Again, he has been illuminated for us by the figure of Joseph, son of Jacob in the Old Testament. This indeed is the way that the New Testament writers write. Almost every word conjures up the scriptures of Israel. For the God of Israel is the God of Jesus. And the God of Jesus acting through Jesus would like us to understand who God is and what can better reveal who that God is than reflecting on the long centuries that precede the coming of Jesus, going perhaps all the way back to Adam and Eve. And then in a very special way, and from here Matthew begins his story of Jesus with Abraham, the one who enters into a covenant with God. And through all those generations that Matthew cites at the beginning of his gospel, we arrive at this figure of Joseph, son of Jacob. So let's take a moment of prayer before we open up for some discussion. Let us pray as we prepare to move into Advent time that we all, men and women, might be custodians of the child who is the word of God, as Joseph was, that this word might blossom in our embrace and that we might offer it to a world thirsting for God's presence. Pray for us, St. Joseph. Thank you very much, David, um, and thank you everybody for joining us.
Uh, we've got 100 people on this Zoom call, so we're astounded and we're very grateful for your presence and thank you very much. Um, we haven't asked or charged anything for this course. If anybody is interested in making a donation to the Institute, we would be very grateful for that. Just put it in our bank accounts and mention that it's for the Infancy Gospels and uh, the details are on our website if you need them. Um, so because there's so many on the call, we suggest that you put your comments or questions in the chat. Uh, what I'll do is read them and then David will will answer um, them for us. So if you've got any questions or any comments, please put them in the chat. There's already one from Keith Powers, who says, why did people in the Old and New Testament times put so much faith in dreams, whereas we do not believe that dreams have any significance? Oh, I believe that dreams have significance. <laughs> Keith, you are obviously not a Freudian. Freud certainly believed that dreams have significance. Um, I think that indeed our people in more traditional cultures are aware that God speaks in many different ways. And the unconscious is a way that God can really reach us. I think that when we are very, very much in control, very conscious of the world around us, we sometimes think that we are God. And I think that there is a great wisdom, not only in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but even today to realize that when we are sleeping, we are not so much in control. Now, one of the great things about the figure of Joseph was the recognition that by listening closely, he could take a certain kind of control, always led, but that would change history. Again, we're talking about the saving of that child that is under constant threat all through those first two chapters. So again, I'm not a great expert on dreams. Thank you for the question. I'll probably be thinking a lot more about it. But that is what I would say as an initial attempt to answer a very good question. Thank you. Uh, Hugh says, I can't believe that the 40 minutes passed so quickly. Um, that wasn't a question, is, Hugh. No, it was just a comment. He was allowed to put comments. <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, Namita asks, hi, Father, could you quickly re-explain the fourth parallel between old and new, a father, not a father? I think I missed the parallel. Thank you. Okay. So probably you didn't miss it. I probably didn't explain it very well. So I'll explain it again because it's not a absolute parallel. Okay. Our Joseph that we focused on is Joseph, son of Jacob. And I'm going to say, hope no one will be scandalized father of Jesus. I again don't like the adopted. Okay, we all understand what it means when we say adopted. It means it's not his seed. But again, without him, there would be no Jesus. And if you remember, it was Pope Francis, the Holy Father, who introduced Joseph into the Eucharistic prayer alongside Mary. And I am very happy about that. So again, what is the parallel? Our first Joseph, meaning the second one, our New Testament Joseph, is a father, not a father, because he is empowered to be father, name the child, and then takes very seriously his fathering role, uh, preserving Jesus, keeping him for us. Okay, so hopefully that's clear with the first Joseph. The second Joseph, who is actually the first one, Joseph, son of Jacob, uh, in the Old Testament, is a father, not a father, because he has generated children by his own seed with his wife in Egypt. But when he comes to his father, his father renders him not a father by saying, these two children are my children. They will be included. They will be included among my 12 children. Again, the 12 who will then be the inheritors of the land. And there is, of course, the portion for Ephraim and the portion for Manasseh. Ephraim, in fact, will become in some texts, like in the book of Hosea, a synonym for Israel, for the northern kingdom. 
So hopefully now it's a little bit more clear uh, why I say both of them, in a certain sense, are fathers who are not fathers. Um, so Hale says, uh, hello, Abuna. What, why did Jacob specifically tell Joseph that his children will be like Reuben and Simeon? Any significance there when you compared to the other children of Jacob? <laughs> Hi, Suhail. Good to hear you. Suhail is sitting in Jerusalem. So, um, yes, let me think about that a little. First of all, of course, Reuven is the oldest, okay? Reuven, I see a son. So as far as I remember, he's the oldest. There is always that kind of competition between Reuven and uh, Judah, okay? So then the question comes, why him and Simeon? I'll have to get back to you on that. I have a little theory in my head whirring around, but I don't want to shout it out because someone might say, no, Father, that's not correct. I'll say it because why not? Why can't Father make a mistake? And so hell, thanks for the question because I've never really thought about it. I think it might have something to do with the role that the two play in the Joseph story. I think we have to go back to chapter 37 and look at the role that uh, these two of the these two sons might have played in the Benjamin story. Okay, remember there's the whole debate of what should they do with Benjamin? Should they kill him and they throw him into a pit and then go and decide? And then one of the sons will say, no, let's not kill him, let's sell him. So I say there's, a, there's a, maybe a hint there. We can go and look and we'll get back next week and see if I was right or wrong. Unless someone knows that I'm wrong and they can shout it out right now. It's not Benjamin, it's Joseph, isn't it? Who was thrown into the pit. And Joseph, the... sorry, sorry. Did I say Benjamin? Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Good okay. good correction already. <laughs> so. uh, Christine has a, a different question. Uh, she says, I was surprised by the language that you used around adoptive parents versus real parents and fatherhood in a way we cannot imagine. Your account seems to work to provide an argument for Joseph being a real father. Could you say more about how your insights on Joseph sit alongside with those who find him a valuable inspiration around adoptive parenting families that don't, don't fit into society's norms, etc.? So thank you for that question, because it means I have to be more sensitive to adopted parents. Okay, I think I'm coming from the other side. And let me say where I'm coming from. Years and years and years of working with children who have only mothers. In other words, there is no father. OK, I sometimes would say, you know, people would come and visit and say, OK, these children, there's the mother, where's the father? And I say they're all immaculately conceived, which is, of course, not the reality. It's the reality of biological paternity without taking responsibility. And I think I'm coming more from the <laughs> Sorry. Then thinking as seriously as I need to think about how Joseph can be a wonderful model for adopted parents or adopting parents who become real parents as Joseph is a real parent. So I'm coming more from the side of bi biology is not everything. Uh, and in fact, in too many cases, biology is meaningless uh, in the lives of children who grow up without fathers. If Jesus had not had a father, he wouldn't have survived. So I'm coming from that perspective, but thank you for sharing the perspective you're sharing, because I certainly don't want to speak against that um, as being truly a father as well. Um, Francis asks, Father David, uh, this could be too early, but um, has always bothered me. Why the letter J seems predominant in the story of salvation? <laughs> the question is very vague though <laughs> yeah so, uh, no it's not very vague I think we know what you're talking about because tonight we're talking about Joseph and Jesus and then uh, the tetragrammaton the the name of God is with a J let's first and foremost point out that in Hebrew it would not be J but in all those names it would be a Y I hope that doesn't throw you off okay it would be Yosef and Yeshua, and the first letter of the tetragrammaton would be a Yud, okay? And in Greek, it would be a Yota, 
uh, a kind of equivalent of an I. So yes, there is, there's something at play and that might not be completely coincidental. There might be some meaning to that. In fact, I'd even add on thinking it through even more is that we don't only have Joseph, Jesus, and the first letter of the Tetragrammaton, we have the name Israel, okay? Which is not with a J in, in, in uh, English, but it is with that Yud and that Yota in Greek, and of course, Jacob as well. So maybe there is something there. Please go ahead and explore and share with us what you find. Okay, I don't know if we've got a few more minutes, but there aren't any more questions in the chat. So uh, if the, we don't need to force it, and we're going no. into load shedding, so this is blessed that we're not going over time. But let me say a word about next week. Next week, we will be looking at the figure of Mary. Okay, and again, when I say we are looking at the figure of Mary, that means that we are leaving aside for a moment, we'll come back to it afterwards, we are leaving aside for a moment the Gospel of Matthew, and we are going to be plunging into the Gospel of Luke. Because just as it's Matthew who gives us our Joseph, in almost a, a total way, it is Luke who gives us Mary. And so we'll be plunging into the Gospel of Luke and looking in a similar kind of way at the figure of Mary and her role, not only 2000 years ago, but in our lives now, as we prepare uh, for Advent and then prepare for Christmas to welcome Jesus into our lives. Thank you very much, David. Just to remind everybody that we will be putting the recordings up on YouTube, uh, just give us a day or two. Um, and you'll be able to find them on the Jesuit Institute YouTube channel. And uh, there's a lot of thanks in the um, chat from uh, Eswatini. And thank you for an interesting presentation. Thank you very much. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you very and much. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you all and good entry into Advent. Thank you.